Awesome. Uh, it's always hard going on after lunch because everybody's kind of a bit tired from like all the talking and all the eating. So I'm going to try to be a little bit more energetic than usual to hopefully keep the whole audience from not falling asleep in their chairs here. <laughs> cool. Um, just before I get started, I'm wondering here, who is actually deploying microservices in production? Only a few people. That's actually probably a good thing. Um, I've been giving a lot of talks about microservices, and one of the biggest problems I've been having is people are too excited about the topic right now. Uh, people talk my ears off about it, and then I ask them how large their startup is, and they're like, oh, we're three guys in a garage. And I'm like, eh, that's probably not the best thing to focus on right now. Um, the slides, get the slides. <laughs> we have technical difficulties with the slides, one second. Yeah, so what, I'm, what I, I t like to tell a lot of people is, if you're a startup and you're at the early phases, I think some people were talking about this earlier in the cloud uh, panel, is you shouldn't be looking at microservices when you're a three-person startup. Um, finally, there's my slide. Um, there's a great quote. I, I can't find who said this, but uh, this is, gets spread around, is most great companies start as a monolith. Uh, DigitalOcean started as a monolith, and we have grown into 40 microservices internally. But the whole kernel of discovering that our business was valuable and that our business, that people actually wanted what we were building, it was really important to start with something that was very easy to deploy, it was very easy to manage, and things. And once you start to get to that point where, when we started to have about 20 developers, 30 developers, then we said, okay, this monolith is not working for us. We need to start moving towards something that's more microservice oriented and start breaking off the individual pieces. And the biggest thing, a lot of people come up to me and they, they, they think that microservices are just a scalability tool. So they, they're good for scalability, but honestly, the real reason to do microservices is because they help you scale your organization. When you go from what we did where we had a team of five developers to 20 developers, and now we have like 200 developers on our team, being able to have multiple teams that work independently of each other that can grow and you can spin off new teams, that's the real reason. That's the real value statement from a microservice. When you get to 200 developers and you have one monolith, you're going to be in a world of pain and every day will be very painful. But on the flip side, if you're at that three-person startup and you're just starting and you have 100 customers, the monolith is going to be great for you. It's going to be just absolutely wonderful. So I, I like to preface always with this, so that way to like just temper your excitement, because it is a really fun topic and it's really cool. Um, so the, the talk today is really going to be a little bit about kind of an overview of microservices, because it sounds like a lot of the people in the audience still are not using them. But I also kind of wanted to go into depth about how we actually build and deploy microservices at DigitalOcean. So it's not just like an overview talk. You can actually see how does a real company actually use this to get real business done and actually deploy things on time, right? Um, so distributed teams. Dis uh, DigitalOcean is 50% remote. So we have 200 people out of our 500 people that are fully remote. And for example, my team, we're in four different company, countries on a five-person team. <laughs> so these are the kind of things where microservices start to really shine because it means that our team can really work independently. It's, we don't have time zone or continent restrictions with our code. A monolith, we just couldn't do that. Just even organizing a build and deploy with a distributed team would be very difficult. So, I'm just curious, who here today is actually working on a distributed team or has multiple, multiple tech centers for their company? Only a couple. Okay, so is this mostly kind of a, is this mostly smaller startups or raise your hand if you're kind of still in the kind of a startup mode? Okay, oh okay, good, a large portion of the audience. So while this talk will be fun, it will be kind of like as your startup starts to grow, you'll get to start to use a lot of these concepts. So there's kind of a lot of trends that are just kind of happening in the background that are, that are kind of independent of microservices, right? We're seeing a lot of customers now be in multiple data centers. We, you know, a flood can happen in a data center. We can see power outages happen in data centers all the time. Being available all the time for your customers. Or you have, I've met a couple startups here in India 
but their entire customer base was in Indonesia. And we're seeing this more and more. So these kind of apps are becoming more and more common. Uh, Docker is coming across the board as kind of like the number one enabling technology. Even if you're using a monolith, Docker should be number one tech that should be on your radar because it's really fundamentally changed how we deploy systems. Um, and going with that, things like Kubernetes. Kubernetes are allowing multi-cloud solutions, allowing kind of scalable Docker containers. Making deployment, making difficult deployments a kind of a thing of the past. Kind of later in our slides, I'll kind of talk about how we actually do deployment, but I'm just kind of giving some overviews here. Uh, we had some fun talks in the hallway, actually, about NoSQL. So a lot of people are really quick to jump to NoSQL, and it's a lot of fun as a developer. There's a lot of cool things, but I think a lot of small site startups are still, MySQL, Postgres, they're still great. My team, we use Cassandra. It's painful, but it's certainly something that you'll grow into. And these are kind of the things that we're seeing as larger companies, we start to see that they grow into things like MongoDB, Cassandra, these kind of larger scale deployments. So you, you say, okay, I'm, right now, Matt, I'm a monolith, and I want to start moving in the direction of microservices and things. And what are the kind of the things that we need to be doing? And this is kind of my checklist, and I'm going to talk about how we do each one of these things, but this is the checklist of things. Even if you're doing a monolith, you can do all these things. And this is what's going to set you into a place where you're going to be able to do it. Um, service discovery is number one. Um, if, you're, if your services, if you're like hard coding IP addresses of other things, like your database or um, your other serv your microservices your ser uh, or other uh, things like your S3 buckets or whatever, you should be really using service discovery. Metrics. If you don't have metrics, you'll never be able to get to microservices. If you, if you can't tell me how fast your app is performing, what kind of, what kind of speed you have, you need, you're, 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 that's number one. Even a monolith, that should be like one of your th main things. And containers, distributed tracing. So we're going to go all into this. This is just kind of like a bit of an overview of like what we're going to talk about. So for me, so I, I work on our time series and metrics team at DigitalOcean. And you might be saying, is it really relevant? Because some of the apps that I build actually get deployed on 100,000 servers. So I have a metrics agent that runs on every single one of our hypervisors to provide metrics about every one of our hypervisors. And you're th probably thinking, is my startup that's running a dozen servers, is it kind of, are the same patterns going to be applicable to the services we build? And I, I'm going to say yes, because some of the services I build also are front end UIs. And the front-end UI is exposed to the clients, maybe run on a dozen machines. But we use the same kind of core basic tools and tenants for our small microservices as things that scale up to 10,000 or 100,000 nodes. And we're going to kind of delve deep into that today. Uh, just so you have an idea, this is kind of our metrics app. And right now, we're storing metrics on a million, on a million virtual machines using it. So it's, it's scaled pretty well. Um, and just so you have an idea, as I go through this talk, you can kind of have a picture in your mind of like what the application that I'm actually describing looks like. So I want to step back and talk about how we build things internally. And I think how you build things is kind of one of the first tenets to get you towards microservices. Each one of these is kind of like a baby step. So this is a really controversial topic. And basically, Google kind of came up with this thing called the monorepo. And the idea is that the monorepo is your entire company's code base sits in a single repo. So when you check it out, you can see all the projects across all the repos. Now, just curious, is anybody else using a monorepo here? Is there any other companies? Oh, these guys in the middle. Yeah, OK. <laughs> you're, you're, you're my standout example. So this is cool. So I get to, I get to like shock a lot of people today. It's surprising how many people will come up to me after this and tell me that I'm just absolutely crazy for suggesting this. So DigitalOcean, we have a monorepo we call the Cthulhu. And we have 40 microservices that sit in this repo with 200 developers committing to the repo. And you think that this is organized chaos, but it's actually really amazing. So what happens is, let's say that you're the logging team, and you're responsible for making sure that logging is secure across all of our applications. 
Well, you can make, in a single commit, you can apply logging changes to every single project in the company. And every single project in the company can approve your logging change. And in one commit, atomically, across the whole business, we can, we can set a logging rule. Or a good example is security, right? There's a lot of times where a security vulnerability will come out, and you need to patch all of your systems the next day. Well, do you even know where all the code is? A lot of times, we have 200 people. Do you think we know where every single service is? It really becomes a central place that everybody can know what is going on in the company. And you can also do amazing things like, let's say that I'm using another team. So actually, I work with a team in Berlin, and they're building our, um, our load balancing service. And I need to interact with their services. I don't have to ever talk to them. I can use their libraries in the monorepo, write tests against their application. If they make changes and it breaks, they'll know. They don't even have to talk to me. I don't have to go to them and tell them that it broke. We're not even in the same time zone. Most of the time, I can't even talk to them because of the time differences. But I can still actually be able to have good integration tests that fit between different groups in the company. Um, I think everybody should be doing this right now. Even if you're a three-person startup, pull request driven development. What does that mean? It means that every single time you do a feature, you make a new branch, you make a pull request, and you have at least one other person in the company sign off on it. It kind of, not, it kind of eliminates the need for doing like pair programming, so it spreads knowledge, but it also ensures that you don't make mistakes, and it makes sure that your master is always in shape. So we kind of have a motto that our master is always deployable at DigitalOcean. So my team sometimes will do three or four deployments in a single day. And across the entire company, we must have 30 or 40 different deployments every single day. So if people are checking bad stuff into master, it's going to have nasty ripple effects across the entire company. So these are kind of the things that are really going to create you know, good uh, coding standards across your company. Even if you're three people, I, I really recommend. This is probably one of the best things to improve the quality of your code base. Um, this is kind of fun. So he, who here is actually like building like APIs and services, like actual, OK, almost half the audience. Now, are, are you guys building that in JSON? OK. How about protobufs? Anybody using protobufs? OK, there's one guy. How about gRPC? Anybody using gRPC? OK, cool. So, what we've seen is the vast majority of the audience is using JSON. I think JSON is great. One of the things that will happen as you start to grow teams, JSON becomes very difficult to have good contracts between teams. So what, what I mean by that is, let's say that I change my API and the actual JSON changes. That might break another team and I don't even know it. So if, you, if you're building things like JSON APIs, I recommend stuff like Swagger, or JSON schema, or some of these things where you can actually define a real schema for your services. Especially for us, we have some APIs that we give to millions of developers. So if we break our contract, it's really going to make a lot of people upset. Um, so what we've done also internally for our high performance services, we've switched to gRPC. So gRPC uses protobufs and it's a lot more lightweight over the wire. So if you have like mobile devices or if you have things that are very high bandwidth, so like if we move a virtual machine across the network, it's like 20 gigs of data, we need to use gRPC. And gRPC also guarantees contracts between groups. So that way if the schema changes, the other team knows. And it's forward growing. So that way like a team can be dependent on a very older version of the schema. But as we move the schema forward, the APIs can continue to work against it. Service discovery is probably one of my favorite topics. And this is the one thing that you should be running out and doing tomorrow. Um, who here is using, uh, who here uses Zookeeper? OK, a couple people. They know the pain. <laughs> anybody use etcd? OK, a couple people. Nice, nice. Uh, anybody using console? All right, two guys in the back. Cool, cool. So we happen to use all of those internally. <laughs> Maybe not on purpose, but it's, it's certainly grown that way. Um, I'm actually a big fan of console. So if you're not using a service discovery platform, uh, console is really one of the best ones to just kind of look at. And if you're not familiar with service discovery, basically what service discovery is saying is, I, I deploy my application. And maybe I have 
service one from another team, I have two different databases, and I have some, and uh, I have another service from another team. And it's like, well, how do I understand where those things are deployed? Well, so some people, they'll hard code IP addresses of where their database is or where the other services is. Some people will set up like load balancers and then you have to have like a load balancer for every single thing in your application and then you have like a dozen load balancers. Um, what service discovery allows you to do is to have this central database where the applications register themselves with console and then every application can actually just look up where stuff is. And kind of the really nice side effect of this is you get this GUI and I can look and I can find every service in the company. So let's say that there's a new team and they're building a service that I've never heard of. Well, I can look in here, I can find that they're building the service and I can find where their endpoints are. Um, it, it becomes really awesome. So as you scale, you really are able to find where you're going and even if you're a small team, it allows you to really change your deployment model. So let's say that a server dies in the middle of the night. You want to have an ops team just be able to spin up a new server, right? And not have to reconfigure a bunch of config files across your cluster. The service discovery allows you to like, get away from that traditional model. Um, so we have a very traditional web app. So like that app that I showed you earlier, just showing metrics to the customer. There's three different databases that actually power that application and three different microservices inside that application. And, and even the things like, we have a traditional MySQL database just to track the users that use it. Even that, we look up in console and we use console. So that way, like if one of the MySQL slaves goes down, we don't care. The ops team can actually just replace it. Or if you can even do things like you can mark servers down. So like you could still have a server up and you can say just don't use it if it's in a bad state. And this is something that's actually very difficult to do in traditional even load balancing setups if you have a server that's just kind of acting wonky and stuff like that. So I, I kind of want to give a cool thing that we did that's, that's not relevant, but it's always kind of really fun. I, I love this example is um, when I first started at DigitalOcean, we were adding like 1,000 servers a day or something ridiculous. And somebody would come to my desk and they'd be like, Matt, why don't we have metrics on these new servers? And I said, well, I didn't know these servers existed, right? Because <laughs> they're in Amsterdam or something ridiculous. And they're like, oh, this, is, this can't work. So we were like, what if we just use service discovery so that way every time a new server comes up, they rack a new server or if a server dies and it comes back, the service discovery it would just auto-register itself in console. And that way we, have a, we, have, we know all of our machines. And I don't have to worry about this ever again. So we took console. And you can put console on every single server as agents. So what we did is we, we, we deployed it to 100 boxes. And 100 boxes went really well. And we said, oh, this is cool. So we brought it to 1,000 boxes. And we're like, oh, this is pretty, this is awesome. This is working really well. Uh, so we deployed an entire data center. Like our New York data center at the time was maybe 10,000 servers or something like that. And all of a sudden, I get this call from the firewall team. They're like, you know, um, the firewalls are all at 100% CPU utilization. And I'm like, uh, really? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> um, and we're like, oh, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. And we, we look, we went back, and it turns out um, there's an ARP cache on Linux. And console is so smart, it will talk between all the nodes in the cluster. So that way, even if there's an outage of your primary console servers, they can gossip between each other to get information. Well, the ARP cache on Linux is like 100 machines. If you have 10,000 servers trying to gossip with each other, you kill your ARP caches. <laughs> so a simple change of making ARP caches allowed us to actually run console on tens of thousands of machines. And the, the master servers are like three virtual machines of like four gig of RAM in each region. So, it, it scales, like console can kind of scale from the smallest startup to the largest. I think we're, we might be one of the largest console installations actually right now. Um, deployment. So deployment is always such a nasty word because every single company does deployment differently. There's like whole companies dedicated to help you do deployment. It, it's become just a kind of a four-letter word in, in programming. Like it's, it's, it's so difficult. And I think one of the things that has really changed it for us as a fundamental across the board, all of our microservices, 
every single build now, we generate a Docker image. That's it. For every single microservice. So every build, we have 40 new Docker images that are created. We may never deploy those Docker images. We may never use them. But we have them for every single commit. right? And every single team is using them. Um, and what happens is now deployment becomes a very trivial thing. So for smaller teams or working on small apps, they can just throw the Docker image on single virtual machines. And it's a very simple way to just to get started. You just throw it on a box. You don't have to install any Unix stuff. You install Docker, you're done. Some of our larger teams, like our web front end and our API front ends, have thousands of boxes or hundreds of boxes, and sometimes they go up and down. So we're actually using Kubernetes. We actually have a very large multi-region Kubernetes cluster. And now, when you want to deploy an application, you just say, I put it on the Kubernetes cluster. If it goes down, it brings it up on another machine. You can tell it, I want four of them in New York. I want eight of them in Singapore. I want two in Bangalore, or whatever. And you can like actually grow and shrink your app to each region. And what's also awesome is recently landed in Kubernetes is you have multi-cloud. So I talked to some people in the audience, and everybody's always worried about lock-in. And we, we understand that. And Kubernetes now allows you to deploy across multiple clouds. <laughs> so it, it, it makes it easy, because it's something you can grow into. It's not something you'll start out with, but maybe you need to be in a unique region. You, maybe you need to deploy to Australia, and only one cloud's there. Or maybe you just want, from a cost perspective or reliability perspective, you want to be in multiple clouds, these kinds of things. Feature flags. So I kind of talked earlier how we always deploy master. Our entire business runs off of master. And you say, that's crazy. How would you run your entire business? You have to have some things that are unstable. So for example, one of the products that I'm working on is a new end user metrics product. And we only released it to 100 users, but you don't see it when you log in. So basically, what we do is we have these special feature flags in the code, and they're enabled per user. And this is, I think, one of the most, the, the best things you can do is put unstable code into master, just put a feature flag around it. Even if you can't do something as, as slick as having it per user, have feature flags. So that way, you can be deploying the same code to your staging environment and your production environment. And eventually, you get to the point where you have like a per user one. And we can actually do things like in our chat room, we can enable customers to try out a new beta feature. And we can just go into Slack and say, OK, enable customer 123, and they get this feature. And if it's unstable, we just turn it off for them. And it kind of isolates and allows us to continually be deploying. And we just always are deploying code, and we're always making sure that we have very stable code in production. Monitoring. This is my love area, because my, my group does monitoring and metrics. So this is like my absolute passion in life. Um, we actually have some pretty elaborate setups. So if you're not doing metrics in your apps, don't do, minor, don't do microservices. We even, so we use a tool called Prometheus. Anybody here actually use Prometheus as their metrics tool? This guy? Uh, how about InfluxDB? Anybody use that? Uh, Graphite? OK, a few people. Uh, Datadog? Huh. So maybe some other people call out, because there wasn't a lot of hands raised. Anybody use a different metrics product? Call out, yell out, it's fine. I guess not, OK. All right, so I'm hoping that maybe you guys are just being quiet, because like, I want to see everybody have a metrics product. If I'm here next year, everybody should have, OK, I'm using a metrics product, one, two, three, because this is the most important thing you'll ever do in your application. Um, so we use a tool called Prometheus. And Prometheus is really cool, because it's actually built on the Google model. Whereas most metric systems, you push metrics into them. This one actually pulls metrics off of your systems. So that way, if your metric server becomes overloaded, it just slows down, and you just get less frequently updated metrics. But you never lose your metric system. And what's also kind of cool is if you get to the point where you're in multi-regions, you want to roll up metrics data across all of your regions, right? You want to see what is the average response time across all my regions. And Prometheus can do cool things like it can actually roll up into multiple data centers. And we run one per data center and roll it up into our master in New York. Same thing for logs. I think logs are probably one of the most intimate tools that developers have, right? Like, 
everything we do is logs, and everything, and logs are so important. I mean, for us, logs are so important that we have four dedicated racks of servers, about 100 servers dedicated to our logging cluster in New York. And what we do is we believe you shouldn't log the files. And we say everything should log to syslog, and then you should forward your syslog to, you can use a SaaS product like Logly, or we use, we use um, Elasticsearch as our backend for all of our logs. So we actually pipe syslog into Elasticsearch, and then they have a really nice front end called Kaibana, uh, which I'll show in a minute. And basically, have all your logs in a central place. If you're SSHing into a box to look at your logs, you've failed. You've absolutely failed. I mean, that's okay when you're maybe at three boxes, but all of a sudden, if you get to 10 or 15 boxes, there's no way you can log into them. So you want to make sure that you get a centralized log solution. And it doesn't matter who it is, but I just really recommend people, by making yourself not write to files, you kind of force people to use the central system, and that's what actually makes it happen. Um, this is probably my favorite piece of software on the planet, uh, it's Grafana. So we use this internally for all of our metrics and monitoring. Uh, basically, if you use Graphite, InfluxDB, Prometheus, or pretty much any graphing solution, you can use this as your front end. It's absolutely amazing. It will give you the best looking charts. It will make you look like a god because all of your charts will look so good. Um, I can't recommend any tool more. If you take one tool away from this talk, I would get Grafana for your metrics and monitoring. Structured logging. Um, this, is kind of, this has kind of really come out. I still see a lot of apps where, and traditionally when we wrote logs, we would say user XYZ percent S has done action YZ, right? Um, don't do that anymore. <laughs> so now we're talking structured logs means that we actually write logs as JSON. We actually take attributes of the log. So for example, the username would be, in the actual, would be an attribute of the JSON message. Uh, if you have a transaction ID, so like for example, every single call to our service, we have a transaction ID. So if a customer calls up and they say, oh, we're having a problem you know, spinning up a virtual machine, we're like, oh, we can look in our logs and we can see logs specifically for a specific customer. Um, and this is kind of allows you, when you start using things like Kibana, you can actually do queries against your logs. And this becomes incredibly powerful when you, when you want to be able to search against things or if you have so many different services, you don't know necessarily where to start for the logs. I'm curious, is anybody else here using structured logging? There's, okay, there's like four or five people. This is cool. So if you're not using it and you want to know more, I t come talk to me because I, I, I think this will be one of the biggest productivity. It will be a big productivity boost for you, actually. Because um, you can get tools like Kibana, which is free. You can install this free. And basically, Kibana gives you a structured view of actually your logs. So I have a video now. Oh, because this is a PDF. Um, but basically, what you can do is you can even you can filter it. So like, you know like how you're on an e-commerce site and you're like, I want a bag and I want a red bag. Well, you can do this with your logs now. You can say, I want API, I want the metrics API, I want users Y, Z, and T, and I want it on Thursday at four o'clock. And it will actually be able to split out your logs like that. So you can even put in performance metrics in here. You can make dashboards with the logs. You can do a lot of really powerful things with the logs. Um, this is something that everybody should be moving towards, even if you're going to stay with the monolith. This will just make your life better. And eventually, when you get to a microservice, you'll have to have something like this. You just, you just can't get away with it. And you can even do bad dashboards. So one of our teams, they don't have metrics. They just write their metrics to, to the log file. And you can draw dashboards of like response time and usage just from the log files, which is really nice. So you don't have to have multiple metrics and logging systems. I think over time, metrics and logging will eventually just combine and it will just be one service. It's still kind of fuzzy now, but I think that's going to be the future. Distributed tracing. I'm just going to touch on this because this is, this is advanced level, A level stuff, and it's really cool. And I like to talk about it just because it's really fun, cool stuff. But basically, distributed tracing is saying, I have two microservices, or I have three microservices and a database, and I want to track the transaction flow between them. So let's say that a user logs in and it kicks off three different microservices. Well, how do I know how much response time each one of those microservices took? 
how do I know that the MySQL database took 200 milliseconds in the third microservice, and how does it all add up, right? So basically, distributed tracing allows you to do a distributed call graph across your entire network and be able to like get lines and be able to monitor your application across multiple microservices. Um, I'm gonna tell you that this is still work in progress stuff at most places. Like we don't even have a good system for this. So kind of the open source one from Twitter is called Zipkin. It's absolutely the ugliest UI ever. Um, if you guys ever want a fun open source project, if you built a distributed tracing UI, I think you'll be like very successful. There's, um, there's about four or five startups in the space, but I don't think anybody has really nailed it. Um, but I think this is the future. As more and more companies move to microservices, you're gonna see this is like one of the, gonna be the biggest pain point that's still very much unsolved in this market. And that's basically it. I'll open it up for some questions. Let me get your mic across to you. Uh, where are you? Oh. More elaborate on distributed tracing and DNS SRV and the RPC. Say that one more time. Can you be elaborate more on distributed tracing and uh, DNS SRV and RPC? Yeah, so it sounded like there's two questions. D distributed tracing and maybe the RPC stuff, yeah? Yeah, so the distributed tracing, so, okay, so let, let's break down an example. Let's say that you go to a web, let's go, say you're on a mobile app, even better. So you go log in on the mobile app and it makes an AT, API call to your backend, right? So your backend at that point will generate a GUID or an identifier of the transaction. And let's say that that login call needs to call against three different databases internally. So it might call three different other APIs. It will pass that identifier to each one of those APIs, and each one of them will generate an identifier. And, and they will log in, and, like, and each service will log how much time it took in different areas. So one, er one service might take 100 milliseconds in compute time, it might take 50 milliseconds in MySQL time, and then there might actually be more time because the main service is waiting on all the services before it can respond to the user, right? A lot of times tracking down performance issues in a distributed system of multiple microservices is incredibly difficult. And that's where distributed tracing comes. You start to log each point in the RPC process. So this one, it, uh, like, it validates to a single region or multi-region? A, a s single region or? Multi-region, multi-region in the DC. So it could be. So generally speaking, you want to have your microservices in a region, right? Like you shouldn't typically want to be building things across multiple regions like at the same time, but sometimes you can't. So I was talking to a startup in uh, Thailand actually where their primary data center is in Singapore and they have a secondary data center in Europe. And so some of the services do need to cross, talk across the internet to get data to respond. And that would be something that you would really want to monitor the performance of because the latency could be really, could be really bad for that kind of a situation. Yeah. Say that again? Zipkin, or open tracing. Okay, um, so normally it's very difficult to track down problems in a, uh, you know, in a microservice architecture, uh, because the manifestation of an error could be completely different, and when you start debugging from there, you'll realize that some other service has failed. So it takes a while for you to, uh, you know, debug and fix a problem in a microservice architecture. So can you throw some lights on that the challenge, kind of challenges that you face and how you address that in the in a microservice architecture? Yeah, I, I agree. And this is probably the biggest roadblock for people adopting microservices is the difficulty of debugging. And that's where, first off, having the centralized logging, right? So first off, if you can't find where the error is because you have to look into 100 different log files, that's gonna be number one, is getting the distributed tracing. Number two, if it's a performance problem, it's gonna be your metrics, right? You're gonna make sure that you have metrics instrumented on each service of like latency and response time. Um, and then if you're, if you're really talking, you have a huge amount of services, that's where, just going back to the distributed tracing, that's where you need a tool like that for. Yeah. Any other questions? It's the guy okay. in front. Okay, getting the mic. Uh, 
uh, Matthew, you talked about a uh, lot of aspects uh, in, in a distributed system, right? And uh, and and the importance of logging and uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, which which part of the architecture do you actually uh, build in enough? Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, logic to kind of implement, say, as automatic healing or a self healing in in a DevOps scenario or you know in a, in a real deployment scenario. Is it something that you built in a service like console or you build it as a as a part of your logging infrastructure itself, and how do you kind of manage to do the self-healing part of the uh, of the infrastructure? That's actually a really great question. So on self-healing, there's really three approaches that people take, right? Um, the very traditional one was you have a load balancer, and the load balancer is kind of the self-healing mechanism, right? It kind of takes things out. Uh, over time, having 100 load balancers in the company doesn't scale. And using something like console is great because you can be scaling up nodes and allows you to have a different mechanism that's actually maybe growing the number of nodes. So let's say that you're using something like Kubernetes or Mesos that are actually managing new nodes coming in. The console is going to ensure that everybody can find those new nodes. So it's, there are just two pieces of the puzzle. And so I would say, the first one is, how do you find the nodes? That's the first part of the self heat. Oh, there's three. Uh, two, how do you know the nodes are unhealthy? <laughs> right? And the three, third is, you have some kind of external thing that is actually spinning up new nodes. And right now, I recommend Kubernetes is, is really the best solution for that at the moment. Sounds good. Thank you, Matthew. Oh, there's oh, there's one, one more. last question. OK, just last one question. Uh, can you uh, elaborate how uh, console and load balancer work together? Yeah, that's really good. So actually, so, um, our internet-facing applications use load balancers. And basically what happens is the, we're using HA proxy. And what happens is the console agent on the HA proxy machine will rewrite the console config, or will rewrite the HA proxy config file based on console in real time and, re, and do sig hops to it. Awesome. Thanks, awesome. Matthew. Um, I was looking at some of the Twitter traffic, and looks like a lot of people enjoyed the session. So thank you very much. And there's a little bit of a goodie bag for you, Matthew. Thank you.